Hello my friends, it is 3 in the morning, and that means it is time to do another tier list. Today we are going to probably the most requested of the tier list, which is the Legacy of the Void campaign. Wings of Liberty stuff, you generally have access to everything, so it's pretty, like you can experiment on your own pretty well. Uh, Heart of the Swarm, everybody has their favorites, and most everything is actually pretty viable, which is impressive. Legacy of the Void, on the other hand, you have to pick and choose. Not permanently, but from mission to mission. And things can be a bit wild from each other. So, with that in mind, we are going to be jumping into it. And we're going to start from the bottom up. Not of the tier list, but of the uh, tech order. So, we're going to start with the low tier stuff. We're going to move on to the high tier stuff. I don't remember the exact order on the War Council or anything. I don't think it matters. So, I do know that the Zealots are first. And I do know that the Iyer Zealot is the number one. This is the guy with Whirlwind. His auto attack is the same, I believe, I hope. One of the things is I don't entirely remember if it is the same damage as normal or if it's half damage because I think it was the co-op Artanis originally did reduce damage with his Halberd. I don't think that's the case in co-op. I think he does full no normal Zealot damage with the attack. If he does half damage, he sucks. If he does full damage, he's still really bad. So, uh, why is he bad? First of all, we're going to be doing Brutal again. Brutal is the difficulty. I mean, you can kind of do anything on, like, normal difficulty, whatever. You can make mass sentries and you can probably win with it. The Iron Zealot on Brutal suffers from one of the major weaknesses. There is a lot of AoE in Legacy of the Void. And the Whirlwind ability makes you do 10 damage per second for 3 seconds and you uh, lose your hitbox. So they stack up really, really hard. That means it can be very good against things like uh, Zerglings and Zerglings. Yeah, they're really good against Zerglings. <laughs> Unfortunately, things like Banelings that often accompany Zerglings, big counter to it. Siege tanks become a very good counter to it when generally Zealots are actually pretty good against tanks. The Hybrid Destroyer and the Hybrid Behemoth and I think the Reaver all do splash damage. There is a whole lot of splash in this campaign, and this guy gets punished really, really hard for it. So, unfortunately, he is going to end up in C tier. I do, I, I, kind, I have a soft spot for him. I think that he's funny, and he's kind of fun and cool, but he just doesn't quite bring what you need in a zealot, because almost always when you're buying zealots, you are doing it as a... I have extra minerals because gas is the most important protoss, resource and I need to spend these minerals somehow so I'm going to get something that acts as a barrier to protect the rest of my forces and the other two do that job a lot better so the centurion is coming up next and I actually quite like the centurion he has two abilities first is his charge is replaced with shadow charge what that means is uh, he will be able to phase through your units when he's charging to the target this is really nice because when you have your giant blob of Protoss stuff moving around, Zealots end up in the middle all the time. And being able to pass through is kind of like the Ultralis Burrow Charge. It just rearranges your forces for you, and it's pretty good. His second ability is Dark Coil, which is a single target stun for a short duration. The Centurion is really, really, really good at tanking in the early stages of Legacy of the Void. Unfortunately... The Dark Coil doesn't work on heroic units. I don't remember if it works on massive units. It effectively, it loses power as time goes on because more and more and more things become immune to what it's doing. And those things become more important. So as a result, I think that the Centurion Zealot earns a very, very fine B tier. B is quite solid. I am never unhappy when I select the Centurion. He just does his job. Unfortunately, he can't always do that job. Then there is the Sentinel. The Sentinel is a zealot who has the ability once every 180 seconds he comes back to life. And even more important, he is mechanical. This seems weird to be important at the beginning. However, this means that he benefits from the repair beam upgrade, which is important. It means that he is not biological, so he doesn't take extra damage from stuff like Archons. He is not vulnerable to the Ghost Snipe ability. 
There's a bunch of random stuff that not being biological is actually really good for, and there is nothing in Legacy of the Void's campaign that actually punishes mechanical units. The Landed Viking, for example, does bonus to mechanical in 1 versus 1 now, but that change was made much later and it does not retroactively apply. As a result, I think that as soon as he becomes unlocked, the Centurion Zealot is one of the best ways to spend your minerals in the game. It continuously and reliably soaks for your army and gets that value, especially if you're willing to pull the ones that are off cooldown back and just wait. You can get that 100 mineral value over and over and over again. He does his job really nicely. He's never going to win the game for you, but you never are going to be penalized for warping him in. Alrighty, let's head over to the ranged warriors. Now, first ranged warrior is the stalker. The stalker is exactly the same as the ladder stalker. It has blink, however, I guess I shouldn't say exactly because it has a passive ability that when it blinks, it restores its shields over time. This ability is good. It's actually legitimately very good if you use it. And that is one of the things that I don't know how to rate this unit because I have actually done Legacy of the Void Stalkers only where I use no Spear of a Dune abilities. I only used Blink Stalkers and it was surprisingly doable. It was very hard at the end, like incredibly hard. The host was insane and uh, Salvation was also very tough. However, if you Blink Micro properly, this thing can win every fight in the campaign without the Spear of a Dune. However, once you get it, that's uh, not really reasonable for most tier lists. That's not like gonna put it in S tier. It doesn't meld well with most armies. Its damage on its own is actually pretty bad. It's fairly expensive for what statistics you get. And in the end, I think it's actually just all right. I would put it at a consistent and reliable B tier. I think that basically if I'm playing a more complex Legacy of the Void style or if my micro wasn't as good or if I just didn't feel like microing that day, the Stalker is not the unit I would ever pick. It just doesn't really support the army as well as other things can. However, it does support the army better than the Dragoon. The Dragoon is a unit that unfortunately a lot of people mix up with the Co-op Dragoon. Artanis' co-op Dragoon is awesome. It's really, really good. You can just make a bunch of those and then maybe a couple support things. They have huge range. They're really durable. They have that Guardian Shell and all that stuff. They're awesome. The Dragoon in Legacy of the Void proper is, um, it's got a lot of problems. The first one is that it only has six range. Now, that is the same as the Stalker. That is the, it's one more than the Adept. However, the... Second problem that goes with it is that the physical spacing that a Dragoon takes is very, very large. A max, like uh, 15 Dragoons takes a much bigger volume than 15 Stalkers or Adepts. And that means that st or Dragoons get stuck behind each other, especially when fighting things like Siege Tanks. They have really hard time getting past each other to target fire important targets like that. Another big problem with them is their projectile speed. It is very, very slow for a unit that often gets stuck at max range. And what that means is a lot of the time, the Dragoon volleys fire, and then something like a Colossus or some Psystorm AoE or really one of a million different tar sources of damage in Legacy of the Void will kill the target and there will be just no shot. It does, I mean, the shot fires and it doesn't connect with anything. This happens a lot more than you would think, so that means that the damage output of the Dragoon is less high compared to the Stalker, whose projectile is actually pretty quick and will connect with the target. As a result, it does have 40 more HP, which is nice. It is pretty rugged and durable, so you can just kind of make them and they'll do stuff. But they have a problem, especially if you're more... <sighs> when you put it with stuff like Colossus, they can walk over it. The spacing is not a big issue, but it just, it messes with the army. It makes it hard to move around. Things get stuck inside of them a lot. They like block off your immortals from attacking. 
They don't really play nice with the rest of your army, and for that reason, I'm going to have to put them in C tier. Uh, and then the Adept is the final one. The Adept is a unit that has abilities that a lot of people don't know about in a weird way. So the Adept has one less range than the Stalker or the uh, Dragoon. And to make up for it, it is much, much smaller. And that means that Adepts can put a huge amount of Adepts in a small space. Now this does make them slightly more vulnerable to area of effect abilities. However, it also means that their volley DPS is really, really high. They can send out just a lot of Adepts can hit one target very easily. And they also do a lot of damage. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's really, it's significantly higher than you think it is. They can hit ground and air. They shred through things like Mutalisks, and there's a lot of Mutalisks in Legacy of the Void, and they can often be a pretty big threat. Light air units, I think, are... I don't want to say that they're more important to kill than armored air units in Legacy of the Void, but there's a lot of Banshees, a lot of Mutas, etc., etc. Just these small things that the Adept takes out very well. I'm always convinced that it's a pretty good buy for an Adept. They're also cheap. They are 100 minerals and 25 gap. No, are they? Oh, they might not be cheap. I'm not going to take that part because I don't actually remember what their price is. They might be the exact same price as these guys. However, they have a couple more abilities. First of all, the shade ability. You launch out the shade and after a couple seconds, it uh, swaps the two units. It's insane. There are so many objectives that you can use the shade to just bypass the enemy defenses, get to and snipe really awesome with abilities like uh, Recall, because then you just take it down, bring your whole force back home. If you've not played Harbinger of Oblivion, that's when you unlock the Adept. Oops. I would give that a shot. And then one other ability that often gets forgotten is when the Shade passes through a target for, I believe it is five seconds, that target gets minus five armor. That is so big. They take five extra damage from every source that hits them. Include it. It's not even minus five armor. It's just plus five damage. Because things like Psy Storm hit it more. So Psy Storm does 40. No, it does 80 damage. And it ticks. Uh, oh gosh, how does it do? Yeah, it does 80 damage by hitting for 10 eight times in a row really rapidly. But if you put the thing on it. That Psy Storm now hits for 15 every tick eight times in a row really rapidly, doing 50% more damage with Psy Storm. It's really insane. The Ascendance Orb does more damage. The Vanguard, who shoots shoot 16 times, does almost double damage. This thing, even the Destroyer becomes good because it turns the chain from one damage to six. It is an enabler of so many other high-tech units with just the press of a button. It's really, really strong. Okay, let's go into the sentries next. Uh, the basic sentry has guardian shield and it has an active shield restore ability. I think that it is pretty all right. It can restore shields to two targets at the same time. The rate is pretty okay. It's not as good as like a medic heal or something because any whole damage is going to be permanent. Guardian shield is one of those abilities that's actually good. However, there's so many other things going on with Legacy of the Void armies that often it's hard to remember to hit it. I think all in all, the Sentry is fine, B tier. I'm never, never going to be upset. However, it also is a little bit, eh, whatever. It's just a unit. Unfortunately, it does die to a lot of AoE. It's very weak, and it gets targeted down a lot because Brutal AI specifically targets healers. And actually, that's probably its biggest weakness, is that the AI loves to snipe these bad boys. The Havoc, I feel pretty similarly with. It has a target lock ability where the target takes 15% increased damage. It has a plus two range ability for all ranged units, which is actually pretty darn good. Uh, it definitely makes a lot of mid-ranged units into a much better sniping force. It does tend to run in front of your army in order to do the target lock, though, which is a bit annoying. And then it has force field, which is an ability that doesn't get used very much. It's kind of like the Guardian Shield, where if you had unlimited APM, it'd actually be really good. However, there's so many other things to do. I'm just going to put it in B tier. It's fine. 
Energizer, on the other hand, is absolutely busted. It applies a buff to your units that gives them 50% increased movement speed and damage. It is stim pack for anything in the game, and stim pack is already one of the best upgrades in the game. It's, uh, it's wild. And then, on top of that, it has the ability to phase into a pylon that can be used to warp in units. And warp in pylon normally costs 75, 75 uh, solar energy to use, and yet this thing can do it at will. It doesn't cost any energy. It can just deploy, undeploy, redeploy, wherever it wants. It makes reinforcing your armies on the go really simple. I love the Energizer. It is just better. It kills everything. Like, having extra range is sort of a defensive thing where you take less damage. The Shield Restore is a defensive thing where you take less damage. However, Legacy of the Void really rewards aggression in a lot of ways, and 50% attack, attack speed and movement speed allows you to respond and take out threats really fast. It's pretty wild. Okay, DT is next. Uh, what is the first DT? Where's the Avenger? The Avenger is interesting. It is a Cloak Dark Templar that's only ability is that it every 180 seconds, or is it 120? I don't remember which. I think it's 180. I think it's the same as the Centurion. When it dies, it will warp back to your Dark Shrine instead. This is a pretty good ability, actually. We're, we're not going to have any bad DTs. DD, just by being cloaked, the DT is really good. It's effectively a Centurion Zealot, but for the Dark Templar. The big problem with it is that it is very gas intensive to get up and going, and it is pretty easy to lose track of which Avengers have died and which ones have not. And if you accidentally send one into death twice really rapidly, it is not going to pay for itself and it doesn't do a whole lot. However, you just, if you just keep using like human wave tactics with your Avengers, you can really start to cut through a lot of things in a great way. So I'm going to put it in B tier. It doesn't hit air or anything like that, which none of the Dark Templar do. But, and that definitely does take it down a little bit here because it doesn't have a whole lot of abilities to make up for that. But it is pretty consistent and reliable. The Nerezim Dark Templar, on the other hand, is the first S tier unit. Uh, you can, if the opponent has a ground threat and you make the Nerezim Dark Templar, you have done the correct thing. It is the undisputed master of the ground in Legacy of the Void. It is so incredibly powerful. The little ninja slash thing, uh, I think it's called Shadow Fury. It makes you invulnerable while you are using it, which is just madness. It means that groups of DTs can very, very easily take out entire attack waves in seconds, taking no damage in return. And the cooldown is low. There is basically no downside in the unit unless there is an enemy air. And that is, I mean, oh, it's just great. Another big thing about all the DTs this applies to, but uh, a little bit more to this because it has more sniping potential for detectors, is that you can send these out if you know where resource pickups are on the map. And you can use them to just grab those resource pickups really quick in areas that you'd normally have to clear to. That can give you a huge starting speed bonus. The Avenger is not as good at it because it can't sneak past things, but the Nerezim Dark Templar and what is next, the Blood Hunter, both have the ability to sneak past a lot of detectors or snipe them, which is really nice. So the Blood Hunter has an ability that it can target a non flying detector and it will disable it for a short period of time. This is good. You can do a lot of various cheese things with it. Unfortunately, most of the things you can do are also doable by the Nerezim Dark Templar. But that doesn't mean that it's bad at what it does. Uh, you can definitely play the like sneaky hit squad type thing with these guys. It is really just weakened by the fact that any sort of aerial detection is still going to punish it and disable its ability to sneak around. And you can get really caught out of position sometimes with it where you sneak past something by disabling detection and then a flying detector comes in from the side and you're kind of locked in. So it's more of a high risk, high reward or knowing exactly what you're doing sort of unit. But at the same time, it's, it's strong. Yeah, the ability to disable detectors while being invisible is not going to be bad, is it? 
let's go to Immortals next. I like the Immortals. The Immortal, uh, the Ira Immortal, has the barrier ability, and that is it. It gains 200 shields the first time that it is hit. It has a cooldown. It does a ton of damage versus armored. Its other attacks are pretty average. Uh, hitting light units is just meh. I think it's 20 versus light and then 50 versus armored. It gets plus two against light with every... Or not plus two against light, but it gets plus two against everything with every upgrade. And then plus three against armored with every upgrade. It's very, very hefty, bulky, but it's also very expensive. It's pretty good at brawling with hybrid. It just... It's all right to have. Like, if you have these in your army, a couple of them, they're probably going to live throughout the entire mission, and they're going to accrue a lot of damage against armored targets. The big problem is that's really all that they're good against. So, I think that for a specialist like that, B tier is quite a fine rating for them. Where is the Annihilator? Annihilator. So, the Annihilator trades away the, uh, the barrier ability. It doesn't have any sort of super shielding, which makes it a lot squishier. However, it does have the Shadow Cannon activated ability, which deals 200 to any target over a couple volleys. It does a lot, lot more if you have the Adept Shade ability on it, first of all. That is a huge benefit. That's going to come up a lot is... I think it fires like 8 volleys... Which means that if it does 200 damage times 8, that's 240 now. Which is enough to now one-shot a Broodlord, I believe. And that's pretty big. Uh, it does pretty high damage against Armored still. It's not great against Light. However, the fact that this Shadow Cannon can hit both ground and air means that if you surround this guy with some very nice anti-light things, such as that Adept we were talking about, you've really got something nice going on. And it just, it synergizes very well with a lot of different units. And because hybrid are such a big part of Legacy of the Void, having that shadow cannon to deal with them and not having to really care is very integral. A tier. They're, they're awesome. Now, I'm going to talk about the Vanguard. And I'm not putting the Vanguard in S tier, despite the fact that it's really powerful. The Vanguard is very overtuned in Legacy of the Void. It, every volley, it fires volleys like a mortar. It's a pretty close range mortar, mortar, and it hits the target and an area around it. 16 shots. 16. Which is, it's like mind-bogglingly high. Uh, once again, the Adept does apply to it, so if you, say, shoot a, I don't know, an Ultra with it, who is affected by it, you're going to be doing an additional 80 damage because of it. You're already doing hundreds, and because it shoots 16 times, every attack upgrade gives it plus 16 damage. It is a lot of damage. It is an absurd amount of damage. However, it is a more vulnerable unit than the DT. It is more expensive than the Nerezim Dark Templar. It is less fast than the Nerezim Dark Templar. It cannot be warped in like the Nerezim Dark Templar. And it is fighting for the same niche as that Nerezim Dark Templar. Where they're both the kings of anti-ground, however, one king does reign better. The it's going to end up on A tier. The same as the Annihilator, because the Annihilator is more flexible. And flexibility, in my opinion, is one of the most important things that a unit can have. Uh, was that all the Immortals? That was all the Immortals. We could go to Starfighters now. Uh-oh. Um, I think this is the Mirage and this is the Phoenix. The Phoenix is okay. It has the ability to pick up two units at once. It is light. Unfortunately, it is very vulnerable. And the inability to pick up anything that is massive or heroic means that the units that are most important to pick up are the ones you cannot pick up. It also does a double attack that has bonus versus light flying units. It is very, very weak against a lot of the armored things. It's quite good against stuff like Mutalisks, which is very nice. There are a lot of them in Legacy of the Void. However, the unit ends up being very niche. You can toss some of them in. They do run up and get themselves killed a lot if they're in your same army hotkey. However, they will probably pay for themselves in the process. They're good at picking up stuff like Siege Tanks, which is very nice. Immortals. 
Not really much from Zerg that matters that much. I'm going to give them a B tier. They're kind of just like the default version of this fine unit. The double pickup is... It's nice. It really is. The Mirage, on the other hand... The Mirage... Uh, I don't think I can give anything in Legacy of the Void D tier. Because they're all decent. The Mirage can only pick up one unit, but every once in a while when it gets shot, it ignores damage for a little bit. However, the pickup is really the main thing that the Phoenix already has going for it, and that's pretty alright, but halving its effectiveness is pretty bad. The real benefit that the Mirage has is you can charge it through an army thing so you can get vision with the Spear of Adun to drop some blasts. That's, uh... That's not like the greatest niche in the world. Besides that, it's not super useful. I'm going to give it C tier because it act. I mean, I have built them on occasion to do exactly that. And they have won me missions before. But it's like one for one specific thing. And I can't, I can't justify calling that good. What is really good is the Corsair. Disruption Web is a very powerful ability. The Corsair... I don't know if it is the same bulk as the Phoenix, but it feels like it's a little bit bulkier. Maybe it's just the Disruption Web's ability. Disruption Web is an autocast ability that puts a zone on the ground. Every enemy inside of that zone is unable to attack. It's, uh... <laughs> it's the Blinding Cloud from the Viper, but it doesn't cost energy, and it has an autocast. It is wonderful. A couple Corsairs inside of any army are really just... They're wonderful. They drastically reduce the amount of damage you have incoming. The biggest thing that I can say against the Corsair is, one, its attack is not very good. It has that Neutron Flare that fires really fast, and you need a lot of air upgrades. Otherwise, it just gets invalidated very quickly. It also has a big problem where the AI on casting Disruption Web is horrible. It will... If you have 20 Corsairs, it is not uncommon for them to just all drop their Disruption Web on the same target. And if that's not the right target... It can cause some really bad scenarios for you while you're waiting for it to recharge and you're relying on it. However, if you were to manually cast, then it doesn't have that problem. I'm going to give the Corsair A tier almost entirely off of the back of that Disruption Web ability. And it's really just knocked down that little bit because the auto-casting is bad, but it is a real solid A tier. Where can we go next? The Spellcasters. High Templar. High Templar is a pretty cool dude. The feedback ability... It has feedback, right? Yeah, it has feedback. Doesn't really come up that much. However, against hybrid dominators, the spellcaster ones, who are the scariest hybrid, yeah, it just nicks their energy, and then they can't do very much. I've, like, barely done that, but I really should do it more. It's one of those things I think to myself that it's like, oh, this'll be good, and then I just don't. Psystorm as an ability is... It's all right, like, it hits for pretty decent damage. It does not have the shield restore ability, I don't think. Does it? Oh gosh, this is... I always have a hard time with the units that are both have a base unit in Legacy of the Void, have an upgraded form after you unlock it, and have a co-op form. Because they're always slightly different. I'm pretty sure in Legacy of the Void, the High Templar does not restore shields, which is definitely a knock against it. Psystorm does benefit very, very well from the Adept. As I said before, it does 50% more damage, up to 120 per storm against people who are affected by the Adept ability. And then Archons are a great addition. When the Adept runs out of energy, you can just turn them into an Archon, or if you just want a bunch of bulk in the front of your army. And Archons are murder monsters, particularly if you have Energizers with them or Havocs. Or the other sentry. Actually, they're very good with all three of these. They scale because the Energizer allows them to get in and actually fire those shots off. And once they're up at the target, they're, they're monsters. The Havoc, obviously, giving it plus two range means that it can more easily connect. And then the Shield Restore ability means that you can actually pump money into those shield upgrades and make the Archon a lot, lot better. So I like the Archon. I like the High Templar. The fact that you get a two-for-one deal is very nice. 
it's still pretty expensive, 150 gas, you're asking a lot for not a lot of reusability. It's kind of, you get it, you fire off the spells, you turn it into an Archon, and you hope that survives. Uh, where's the... Ah, uh, this is a tough one. No, it's not. Uh, the Dark Archon is S-tier. <laughs> now, the Infester in Heart of the Swarm was also S-tier for its mind control ability, and... One of the large reasons that the Archon is in S tier is because of its mind control ability. However, the Infester does have that ability to recharge energy by eating things. The Dark Archon doesn't have that, but it does make up for it in a lot of ways. First of all, that increased durability from just having a huge shield count is awesome. It, is, it means it's a lot more reusable. Having an attack that is actually pretty okay is nice, and then the confusion ability is super slept on. The one that makes units just randomly attack nearby stuff, that, I don't want to say it's as good as mind control, but it's almost as good as mind control, and it's really cheap. Both of the spells on this unit are just absolutely devastating, and it gets better and better as the campaign goes on because there's more things that are worth stealing. Uh, easy S tier. The only, only bad thing about it is that if you are on one base, it can be hard to afford them. But honestly, you just steal enough stuff that you can uh, then go clear a second base. And once you have those base counts, you don't lose with Dark Archons. The Ascendant I am going to drop also into B tier. <sighs> I kind of want to put it in C tier. Ascendant's got problems. The co-op version of the Ascendant, they took it and they added that, uh, I forget what it's called, Power Overwhelming or something like that, where every time that it sacrifices a unit to gain energy, it uh, gains a permanent stack increase to its shielding and its uh, damage. That makes it a really strong and reliable unit. However, the Ascendant in Legacy of the Void campaign doesn't really feel like it's great at anything. It has that Mind Blast ability that can deal single target damage is pretty high. However, if you're going to do that, I would actually much prefer to have the Annihilator, which effectively fills that same role because that Shadow Cannon ability is effectively as good except it doesn't cost any energy, it just has a normal cooldown, and it is on the body of an immortal instead of being on the weak body of a High Templar. And then the Psionic Orb is pretty lackluster. If you get a bunch of them, they have the ability to really dominate a big group of units if you're not going to have any other fights after that for a bit. But you need so many that honestly you could do that with any comparable cost army in the game. <laughs> it has a consume ability where it can eat things to gain energy, but I'm going to put the Ascendant in C tier because it doesn't do anything that other people don't do better. And that's just kind of a shame. Let's go to the Siege units. First, we're going to jump over to the Firewalker Colossus. Uh, that's not his name at all, but it sounds cool. <laughs> he is good. So he's a Colossus. Colossus is very nice because long range is obviously great. And then the ability to be in the back of the army is quite strong. And there's a little bit of a weird synergy with Colossus type units in Legacy of the Void. In that the way the AI works is if, say, they have something like a Corruptor and they're going to bring it on over to attack. Because your Colossus is in the back, a lot of the time they'll just walk over your anti-air and get killed before they ever touch it. This means that Colossus do a really good job at just pulling enemy units into the fight and make things a little more gradual instead of big bursts of enemies. It's a small thing, but it matters a lot. And most importantly is that fire ability. The twin lances that do a ton of damage on their own are benefited by the fact that they put that fire ability on the ground that applies a it's like is it 50 damage or is it 100 damage either way it is a large amount of damage to anything that passes through it and it effectively creates force fields of doom 
where everything that touches it dies or gets significantly weakened. And once again, the Adept, because it's a damage over time ability that is ticking multiple times, does bonus damage with it, makes it even better, and then the Adept is a really good anti-air component to help out with it. The Fire Colossus, easy A tier. Probably the strongest of the, like, the most capable at killing things units. <laughs> it puts out so much damage. For all the ground stuff, it is just so good at that. Inside of an army. Uh, these two are better because they work very well on their own. However, if you have a big ball of stuff and you're like, oh, I got some extra supply, what do I put in? Put in a freaking Colossus and it's never going to go wrong. You don't got to do anything with it, just kind of A, move it with your army. It's going to put out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of damage on its own. The Wrathwalker, on the other hand, I am not as big of a fan of. The Wrathwalker has a big problem in its design in Legacy of the Void. The way that it works is that it has a very long, I think it's like three second charge, and then it fires its blast off. The problem is that when you are inside of an army, the charge and then blast sequence is so slow that a lot of the time the Wrathwalker barely gets to actually fire at targets, and a lot of the time because the charge blast that it fires is so slow, it doesn't connect with those targets. That means that the Wrathwalker is effectively not doing its job a lot of the time. To make up for that, it does have the ability to hit air, which is pretty nice when it can hit air. Once again, it often against things like Mutalisks is completely unable to hit them before the rest of your army clears through. I don't think that they really work well with other units, and that is very problematic. It is very Tolderim as well. However, it's not great. In order to make up for all of those things, it does bonus damage versus structures. Okay. Who cares? <laughs> Most of the objective structures in Legacy of the Void have very, very few hit points. And whenever you get an army on top of any structure in that campaign, it's going to die real quick. Doing 175 instead of 100 to it does not matter. It is an unfortunate C tier. I don't think it's very good. And then the Reaver. The Reaver is expensive. It is slow. It has to build its attacks. The attacks have to be able to path manually to the target through the ground. So if there is like a gap or something, it cannot make it. And then the attack that hits is not great. And, oh gosh, yeah, the, the Reaver sucks. I'm actually going to put the Reaver in D tier. There is nothing that the Reaver does that the Colossus with the Fire Lance does not do better. The Scarab is also very slow, and once again, that dang overkill problem just comes in over and over, where it's going to go to a target, that target's going to be dead, it's going to explode in that area, do a little bit of splash to some nearby guys, but not the full target damage, because that full target is gone. And then it has a big problem where it doesn't work with one of the best units. It doesn't work with the Energizer. Because the Energizer does not speed up the process that it builds the Scarabs. So it will fire all of its Scarabs. Most of its Scarabs will not do much. And then it will be able to attack. And it won't be allowed to attack because it doesn't have any more. It is a shame. It is a real, real shame. The Reaver is a shadow of its former self. Obviously, it is one of the greatest units in StarCraft 1. It is a monster. But right here, it is not. We have a couple more. We're going to go for the Assault Ships first, which starts with the Nerezim Void Ray. Who would have guessed that S tier has three different Nerezim things? I know the S tier is supposed to be sacred, but my goodness, all three of these units, if you just want to win the campaign, you can make only them. And it will work. For the Nerezim Dark Templar, I'm pretty sure that basically every mission in the game is beatable with them alone. I know for a fact once you get the Dark Archon, it is true. And I know for a fact once you get the Void Ray, it is true. All three of these do not need any support. They do not need any friends. And they're not hard to do. I, I don't know where else I would put them. So the Void Ray, I, I'm sure you've all played with it. I'm sure 
Everyone knows the Void Ray in StarCraft. It's just absurd, and this one, as it charges up its laser, it gets bonus range. Ends up at a range of 9. 9 range means it outranges basically everything in the game. Once you get enough of them, that means that they will be able to take down most opponents before the opponents can get into range to attack. In addition, they are fairly fast, they have a moderate amount of bulk, they're not light, which means that things like Thors don't have the AoE volley capability. They're not able, like Mutalisks can be taken out by Thors pretty easily, but the reduced damage due to being armored means that you just don't have that problem with the Void Ray. It's the Jack of all trades, King of all trades. You can just uh, charge your lasers and burr your way to victory. No problemo. What a guy. Destroyer, on the other hand, is, uh... It's so bad. It's so, 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 so bad. The charge ability on the Destroyer, it is still the base body of a Void Ray. It can attack ground, it can attack air. The charge ability has a problem where it uh, deals damage to extra enemies nearby and that damn or the number of enemies that it hits with that uh, spread is based on the charge level, so up to three, I believe. The problem is that damage is reduced by armor, which means that on Brutal, against a Zergling, once they have their proper upgrades, I think it's one thing they have plus two armor, or maybe it's just plus one, the chain does one half of a damage to a Zergling. That means it takes 70 70 chain damage attacks to kill a Zergling. Except the fact that I just lied to you because the Zergling regenerates HP over time. It takes more like 80 Void Ray or 80 Destroyer attacks from the second chain to kill the weakest unit in the game. It effectively does nothing, but it does look very cool. However, remember the Adept? When you can turn one half of a damage into five and a half, the unit is still not very good. <laughs> it's it is viable. You can you can beat missions with adept destroyer. Um, that is that is the best I can say. It is going to get C tier simply because being you cannot be D tier by being a unit that is mobile ish has a decent amount of durability, and can hit ground and can hit air. That is the only thing keeping, out of, keeping it out of D tier. And then we have the weird one. The really weird one. The Arbiter. In the Assault Ships class, the Arbiter is not very commonly used. It has a very small radius cloaking field, which is fairly nice. However, in Legacy of the Void, they are pretty good about keeping detectors around. Not good enough to stop the Dark Templar, but often good enough to stop the Arbiter. It has Stasis, which is the ability in an area to freeze enemies. That ability is ridiculously powerful. It is the main power budget on the Arbiter. Uh, the duration of Stasis is fairly long, so you can disable halves of enemies and then take out the other half or just disable their entire attack wave for a bit as you get your stuff set up. Really nice. And then it has the Recall ability. The recall ability allows you to, it's a very small radius that you can teleport units in it to the Arbiter. The problem with recall is that there aren't really missions where the Arbiter is good once you unlock it. You unlock it very late into the game. I think the only two missions that you get access to it are on the host and on the final mission. The Arbiter is used in some, like, really cheeky cheeses in the speedrun, except it's not anymore because they, uh, realized that the Dark Templar is actually better than the Arbiters because they're Dark Templar. So even in the speedrun on, like, the mission it could be designed for, Recall just doesn't really bring that value. It's so easy to get everywhere in Legacy of the Void. There aren't islands or anything you need to hop to. The mission design really could benefit from the Arbiter, but they chose not to. Stasis is very good. It is, once again, it has that bulk. However, it has an abysmal attack. I think it has one of the worst attacks in the game, and it is 350 gas. 
So really you're paying for the stasis ability and you're paying a huge premium on it. And yet I'm going to put it in B tier, even with all those downsides, literally every, basically everything else is a downside. It is not super fast. It is not super durable. Eh, it's actually pretty durable. It's got a bad attack. It has a bad recall ability. And yet stasis is so powerful at dividing and conquering forces. It gets a B tier. We have three more units left and we can go right in. First is the carrier. The carrier is weird. If anybody plays Protoss here, you can probably attest that the Legacy of the Void carrier in the campaign feels off. And that is because its interceptors do not work the same way as the ladder carrier. And it does not work the same way as the co-op carrier. It has a very, very short leash range, and it's very, very difficult to micro as a result. It's... The unit feels clunky. And then the AI is actually quite good at targeting down the carrier instead of the interceptors. Which means that because you cannot pull them back without uh, leashing the interceptors, they have to be in pretty close. And they take a lot of damage. That makes the carrier in small numbers not a very good unit. However, it is one of those units that if you get a maxed out army of them, you win. The problem is that is also true for the Void Ray. And the Void Ray is much easier to work with. It is a, it is a lot more effective in large numbers and small numbers. It is faster. It kills faster. It effectively does everything better. The Iron Carrier does have those two repair drones. I'm not going to forget about those. The repair beam ability does exist on the Spear of a Dune as well, which does mean that it's not like a unique ability, but it is, it's nice to have. It is a durability increaser. All in all, the carrier is not a powerhouse of a capital ship. It is more of a utility one. Sprinkling a few into your Void Ray fleet is pretty nice. It doesn't, it's, it's a pain in the butt to max out on though. It's, and it's very slow. I'm going to put it in B tier. Uh, I wish it was A tier. It kind of feel, it feels like it should be A tier, but it's lack of mobility, it's lack of micro ability means that it just ends up so clunky. The Tempest is also pretty good. The Tempest has a moderately long range. It hits for a absolute boatload. It does a ton of damage. It can hit ground, it can hit air. It has the same overkill ability that, or not overkill ability, it has the same overkill problem that a lot of the other big shooters do where they'll fire like 10 Tempest Roll of Fire on the same target and it'll take three shots to kill it and then seven won't do anything. That is a pretty big downer. And as a result, I think that it is pretty solidly in B tier. The disintegration ability, being able to lock that onto a target and they take a lot of damage over, I believe it's 20 seconds, is all right. Uh, it is one of those, it's <laughs> the number of times that you get the full 20 second duration of disintegrates pretty low, but it is a lot of DPS. If you fire a couple of those onto high targets in a fight, you're going to put some serious damage on them. And then your Tempests are probably going to waste their time attacking Zerglings. Well, they're still pretty good. They're they're bulky enough, they're speedy enough, they they're just like a well-rounded can shoot air and ground flying unit. So I'll take it. Then the Tall Darim Mothership. 1000 minerals, 1000 gas for a powerhouse that does hundreds of damage per hit. Hits a lot of times. Well, I mean, it's not per hit and hits a lot of times, but every volley that it fires does obscene damage. It has the Vortex ability that puts people in a toilet and then they spin around in circles and you can blast them with whatever AoE you choose. It has the Lance ability that just fires a laser out from it and deals, I think it's 200 damage to everything in that line. And then it has Blink. The Blink makes it an incredibly microable unit. Very, very easy to move around, very easy to save when it's at risk. The... Black Hole ability supports armies very nicely, and the Thermal Lance can just cut through things. 
The attack is great. It is so durable that it never dies. The mothership is amazing. It is just a powerhouse. It is a brute that will keep you safe and stable for a very long time. And as a result, I'm putting this very final Legacy of the Void unit in A tier. Even if I'm not going air, actually, especially if I am not going air, because you do not need air upgrades with it, I will select the Mothership over the other two because it is so able to deal with things on its own. Another great thing about it is that in the final mission salvation on Vorazun's side, you can rush out a Taldoran mothership and put it up there and you never have to send anything else to help her. As long as you do basic micro with uh, putting people into the vortex, it takes care of itself. Actually, I don't know if I even use the vortex. I use the laser beam a lot of the time because I'm impatient and it's more fun to watch things explode than it is to watch things spin in circles. It's great, though. It literally can take care of a third of the final mission on its own. And that is something that none of the other units on this list can do. So congratulations, Taldor and Mothership. You're awesome. You're not as awesome as the Void Ray in mass, but you can't be masked anyway. And I think that if you could get multiple of them, they would be S tier. That is really the limiting factor is that you can only have one at a time. Because if you could have like 10 of these bad boys, or bad girls, I guess they are. I don't know, nothing beats you. It would be so broken. Oh, and it can fire while moving, of course, which is great. I didn't say that about the phoenixes, but they can do that too. Uh, Mothership can fire while moving, which is nice because it's actually kind of slow, which means that it kites things well. The phoenix just runs away and gets out of range before it can fire on a target. Yeah, it's good. Taking a look at this tier list, I'm trying to see if there's anything that I'd really disagree with. No, I don't think so. I think that everything from S tier to B tier is just strong to play with, and I'm pretty happy with all of them. Stuff in C tier can be viable at times, but is a it's just clunky and feels not great. And the Reaver. Yeah. It's kind of weird that the Destroyer is higher up than the Reaver, but the Destroyer can... I mean, flying is just so good. You can't have a bad flying unit. That's just how it goes. I mean, the Wraith is the closest you can get. Okay, if you're not the Wraith, you can't have a bad flying unit. Uh. Well, guys, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this third tier list of the campaign units. Tell me what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I don't know. I'd be interested in hearing your choices. Until tomorrow, I will see you next time. Wait, until tomorrow, I'll see you. Whatever. I'm good. Whatever I say when I sign off, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you tomorrow. Peace. Oh, my God. 53 minutes. Oh, jeez.